Hello, so part two of um, the audience's video. We're going to look um, a little why even, I suppose, uh, active audience theory is perhaps not something that we can depend upon in terms of audience theory in the 21st century. And therefore, why we've got a great need, I think, for a new audience theory to emerge. Uh, first of all, though, I don't, I don't want to axe um, Stuart Hall and active audience theory altogether. I mean, there are a lot of strengths to um, audience uh, to this type of audience theory. It does use um, Bart semiology, which we've already covered in previous sessions. So emphasis on meaning of uh, the message and interpretation and decoding the message. So it gives us um, an autonomy as a human being that is able to deal with complex information combined with Gramsci's idea of hegemony to show how media is a site of contestation and that there is always, you know, different ways of interpreting things and different opinions and things and different ideologies at play. So we've got a whole empowerment of the audience. Reception is the most important moment and emphasizes the possibility of difference and so on. So um, I've mentioned Gramsci before, you know, hege hegemony is the exercise of cultural and social leadership by a dominant group via persuasion and appeal to common sense rather than by force. And really what um, the active audience theory does, which is very important, is emphasize the media texts are all about establishing and, um, and maintaining hegemonic positions. But as an audience, we might disagree with those hege hegemonic positions and we might adopt different ideologies, which is a huge step beyond what audience theory was considering previously. Uh, you know, I've given this example of hegemony, anti-social, uh, anti um some idea that smoking is antisocial has become hegemonic, you know, and, you know, I've become a non-smoker and, you know, it's pretty grim, isn't it? You know, when am I going to start having a go at smokers for smoking? That's going to be awful. I'm just going to feel like a rotten human being. But in terms of audience theory, what we can think of here is that you know, this idea of um, the anti-social uh, aspect of smoking is he hegemonic and media texts might transmit that, but we might have an oppositional reading. We might have a negotiated reading to that, and this kind of theory allows us to do those kind of things, which is great. Sadly, well, active audience theory is probably now outdated. Now, Henry Jenkins is a theorist I have a lot of problems with, and if you do my social media module next year, you'll hear me go on about Henry Jenkins for about 20 minutes in the second lecture about why he's wrong about everything. I just want to clarify in case I get into that mode and you're doing that module next year. He's not wrong about everything, that would be really unkind, but his ideas are somewhat undeveloped. Where he's actually good for us is in this context here, where his ideas about convergence culture that see the digital user as a realization of the active audience, it's a perfection of the active audience, what he's talking about here. We are beyond active because we exist in different relationships to the technologies by which audience theories were created in the past. Television, we had a very limited relationship with. We sat and watched it. We could change the channel or the volume or the, I don't know, the contrast or the brightness, I guess, if we're psychos, but, um, but that's really all we could do with it. You know, I, you know, I can watch sport on television and I can shout at the television. You know, if the swans are on and they're playing particularly poorly, I will describe some of the players as having, you know, questionable sort of ethics and morals, questionable behavioural standards. And indeed, I will question the marital status of the player's parents. But that has no effect whatsoever on the game. You know, when I'm ranting and raving at the match, I'm not affecting the game. You, could, you know, when I'm at the stadium as well, and God knows when that'll happen again. But when I'm at the stadium, I'm not actually affecting the game either. But I still rant and rave, right? It's a different relationship to television to the kind of technologies we have today. When I'm using my phone, you know, what I can do now is, you know, follow that player on Twitter and then, you know, send him a stream of abuse on Twitter afterwards. And I don't personally do that. But many, many people do actually do that. And I think it's a terrible thing. You know, I do recognise that footballers go out and try their best. And, you know, and, you know, if they play badly, it's, you know, you shouldn't be having a go at them or anything like that. But um, a lot of people don't agree with that. We're in a continual, we're in a continual process of communication and control. And we're in active use and production mode. We are producers now. We don't just passively accept texts from the past, we're continually involved in a remediation of those texts, in fact. You know, when I'm watching something on TV, I'm tweeting about it. And other people are tweeting about it because they're using the hashtag which links them up to me and we're talking about what's going on on it. When I'm watching football, 
if it's here on TV, I'm tweeting about it. You know, I'm tweeting my opinions. I said, he's having a shocker. He's having an awesome game. You know, that boy, you know, he's just the worst thing that's ever existed. And people will come at me and people will agree with me and so on and so forth. My relationship to technology today is radically different. And this kind of activity is really important and it's not factored into the active audience model. We are now more than active, we're beyond active because we are continually remaking the meaning of things by discussing them in real time, by commenting on them in real time, even possibly by editing them in real time. You know, we're capturing events, we're editing them on our phones, we're putting them out in a different form. You know, we're, re we're doing audiencing on the fly and that's really exciting and that's one of the great things about contemporary culture, but it's not really captured in audience theory at the moment and previous audience theories, even up to Stuart Hall's theory, doesn't really get the head around this. Now, William thinks, you know, this is really about, because audience theory is too much about people, not enough about media. So the discipline, and what he means by that is media studies, has uh, become dominated by an underlying humanism, which only humans and now will appear. In this story, technology incarnates human values and relations by uh, being employed by corporations and institutions who construct content transmitted to an audience at liberty to interpret it as they choose and employ it as they will. It's really the uses and gratifications model and the active audience model. Here, therefore, one only encounters the human and to understand media, one only needs to inter interrogate those undetermined human moments. This is an attractive philosophy, flattering us in placing ourselves and our choices at the centre of the media, but it is fundamentally flawed because it doesn't understand our relationship to the technology itself. And really what we need today is to think of audience in terms of being te technologically savvy and technologically empowered in particular ways, which goes beyond this, view, uh, this viewpoint. Do we even watch anymore? We, we check, we surf, we post, we comment, we message, we make at the same time as watching. So we're a hyperactive audience, not an active audience. And really there's no theory that captures this. Um, now I take um, William's concept of media here um, as a stepping stone to what we kind of need. Um, so mass audiences, including both simple and active audiences, have given way to diffuse audiences. The technology that we use plays a critical role in that transformation to diffusion. We now, we all have similar kinds of technology and we all kind of have the same platforms that we use, YouTube, Snapchat, Insta, Facebook, Twitter, etc. But it's all focused on us. You know, my timeline is different to yours. Your timeline will be different to another person in the classes, etc, etc, etc. We both have YouTube, but what I watch on YouTube is radically different to what you watch on YouTube, unless you like watching sort of mid 80s thrash metal videos, which I recommend you do, but you know, it might not be a thing. So media users today have the ability to control their own media experience in a way that's never been possible previously. And more importantly, to produce and share for themselves. So we're now at the center of the media world in a way that mass media theory, even active audience theory could never conceptualize. And it's not really equipped to explain our role in media today. So what William's talking about we should need to pay attention to the technology. This humanistic vision of us at the end of a production line, we're actually right in the middle of everything now. You know, we are prosumers. We produce and consume constantly at the same time as well. So media are about us, our interests, friends, relationships. They're of more interest and value than many professional products, which is why we spend so much time on social media promote a social bond, they take time up, the part of an attention economy, the essential thing about the economy is where we're looking, our eyes, and their volume is vast, you know, um, what happens on social media couldn't be replicated by a television company in a hundred years, but what happens in one day couldn't be replicated in a hundred years, you know, and we are free to partake in these things in any way we want to. And again, this is really challenging for the idea of very concept of an audience and for any kind of audience theory. And I mean, you know, for example, YouTube, 35 hours of video uploaded every minute in 2010, 100 hours by 2014, 300 hours in 2017. Actually, I haven't caught up with the stats, but I'm thinking it's got to be at least 450 by now in 2020. That eclipses broadcast creation by a huge amount, you know, and it's this volume and the amount that we can do. But the fact that we center our streams of information and our data flows around our interests now, which means that a lot of these theories would look at how we react to things presented to us 
don't work because we don't react to things presented to us anymore. We choose what comes to us. You know, we make deliberate choices. We follow on the basis of our interests. So we edit and curate our media experience over time. These theories which were involved in the mass media age, we weren't involved in the editing and curation of media experience. We were given things by Hollywood, by television, by radio, etc., by the newspapers. Now we make our own media environments. And audience theory really isn't equipped to deal with that kind of individual. So in these media, you know, social media, digital media, their economic value, that of hardware software companies that create the means of production, they have an informational value and they're a disruptive force. Then leading to attempts at integration, censorship and a backlash and new threats to users beyond the scope of any audience theory. And what I'm getting at here really is when we think about these companies and what they do, Yes, we need a new audience theory and we kind of need a new theory of the audience itself as well, because this audience is under threat. Um, the way that these companies derive value, the way that they control us, you remember, you know, I've done this in videos previously, but the way that we're monetized and our data is monetized in ways in order to make them economically viable really creates a new set of threats. And a lot of audience theory, early audience theory, although it was very dehumanizing, it did take the view that media could be dangerous to us. Especially, you know, the media effects um, sort of theories are all about, you know, violent media makes dangerous human beings and that's a danger to society. And even these ideas that, you know, um, it's, it's not surprising that many of the theories, you know, proponents of sort of hypodermic theories were around in the 1930s where propaganda was so important. And, you know, we all know the story of how, you know, propaganda worked out in um, fascist um, states in Europe. So there has always been danger factored into audience theory and we have a different set of dangers today through media, which again, those theories though are not equipped to deal with. So the threats from the user in the broadcast era with like the individual as a receiver, no say, no power, a limited response, but you're largely isolated and largely anonymous. You can't be identified and you're largely singular as well. So the threats, really were kind of minimal. The digital user is not anonymous. We are traceable, trackable, and accountable for our content. The digital user is always not isolated. We're in a constant, always on relationship with the media world. And we face threats like corporate surveillance, the law, our legal activities, state security and intelligence agencies looking at us, cyber criminals coming after us, online abuse, and our very view of the world being altered by dodgy companies like Cambridge Analytica. So actually, although we're now a hyperactive audience and we're in control of our media worlds, it's actually a more dangerous environment for us to be an audience in. And again, we need theory that can explain that. And what I'm getting at here is that, you know, traditional audience theory doesn't even think about this sort of stuff. And even, you know, someone like Henry Jenkins really doesn't think about that kind of thing. You know, he's got this view of the audience has been great. We're so active. You know, we're hyperactive. We create, we make, we're just amazing. But he doesn't think about this stuff, which is really, really problematic. So back to Will again. Media studies, therefore, faces a choice. It has the potential to be one of the most important subject areas going into the 21st century at the forefront of debates around digital technologies and their remaking of the world. But equally is the possibility of being left behind its focus on reception and content and broadcast forms and concepts condemning it to an increase in irrelevance for everyone but itself. Media studies has no necessary right to lead debates on media. It has to fight to prove it understands it better as the most effective critical tools to train and guide its students and the public in the future. It's really a call out for us to contextualize audience theory as what it is, historic, an anom you know, a, 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 a relic of a bygone age which doesn't exist anymore and something that we need to work on and acknowledge the flaws on. We don't just parrot out audience theory as saying, you know, <laughs> Stuart Hall said this. Yes, Stuart Hall did say that, and it was important at the time. But we live in a different media world now, and if we don't move beyond these things, media studies itself stops being relevant. And we don't want that because you're doing a degree in it, right? And you want it to be as relevant as possible. So, audience research 
has got to move beyond the simple, beyond the mass media audience concepts and consider technology, tech companies, hyperactive users and media as the dominant modes of activity, while also considering that the user is an active participant in media who benefits and is potentially at risk through media use. And let me tell you this, my friends, there is a gap out there. Could be somebody in this class who comes up with a new audience theory for the 21st century. And then you'd be rich and famous in like a media study sense. And um, that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? So knock yourselves out. Be great. That's all I've got to say on audience theory, guys. Thanks a million.